Well, thank you so much for having me here and inviting me, Tracy. I'm really looking forward to talking about this topic with all of you and really looking forward to having a robust discussion uh, after I'm done presenting. If you do have questions that uh, come up during my slide presentation, I will be pausing for some questions, but you can also feel free to put some in the chat and I will be trying to monitor that as I go through as well. But um, really, again, looking forward to, to being here with you. Before I get started, just of course, um, as probably everyone does, I just have a few disclosures that I want to report. Um, I'm a member of the Transparency and Openness Promotion Guidelines Advisory Board, um, et cetera, et cetera. The only financial conflict uh, or potential conflict or disclosure is that I have received um, honoraria area for teaching for the Medical Library Association. So I am a medical librarian. That's my background. So uh, today what we are going to do is briefly just talk about scoping reviews, like what are they? <laughs> and then of course, why would you want to use them for meta research? We're gonna focus on one of the articles um, that I have written that is um, kind of in this area, which is on um, health sciences librarians and their engagement in open science. And we're gonna use that as a framework for discussion, but really then we're gonna focus on why and how you can use scoping reviews for meta research. So what kinds of things do you wanna think about when you are actually undertaking this type of research? What are some of the challenges? And of course, what things do you not want to do? So scoping reviews. Um, I'm guessing that many of you have at least seen scoping reviews. Some of you I know uh, just based on some earlier conversation uh, as people were filtering in have been working on some scoping reviews. Uh, but a scoping review is, is basically um, a type of rigorous methods driven knowledge synthesis. So it's kind of like a systematic review insofar as it's really based on that method uh, that you actually are using. So, you know, you set it out in advance, you follow through, um, and it, it's not like a narrative synthesis insofar as, you know, it does have that, that actual rigor behind it. But a scoping review, unlike a systematic review, is really not designed to answer a question. Uh, so usually with a systematic review, maybe you're trying to figure out what it um, intervention might work better, or you're trying to figure out um, prognosis or, or something that has a very kind of narrow, delineated and specific question that you want to answer. Scoping reviews are not. They're really about the scope of research that is out there. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about the JBI quite a bit, but that stands for Joanna Briggs Institute. They mostly just go by JBI now. Uh, they're kind of the lead um, methods people around scoping reviews. And they say that a scoping review can be done for a number of different reasons. And when we're talking about meta research, there's three of them that really are kind of important. Uh, the main one is the fifth one, uh, to examine how research is conducted on a specific topic or within a certain field. But then there's also things, you know, just identifying the types of available evidence that are in a field or to identify and analyze knowledge gaps. There's other reasons as well. Um, I think probably the only one that's sort of not applicable to meta research is as a precursor to a systematic review. Um, because um, usually when you're doing it as a precursor to a systematic review, it's designed to figure out, you know, what questions can you actually answer from the literature. For meta research, we're generally trying to get more of that scope of the research. Um, there's two main pieces of methods guidance out there. There's uh, the kind of the earliest one that was ever published on scoping reviews is the Ersky and O'Malley framework. And that was published back in 2005. So this is a relatively recently defined uh, methodology, but the big one and the most important one that I would recommend that you actually familiarize yourself with if you're going to be undertaking one of these is in the JBI manual for evidence synthesis. They have a whole big chapter on scoping reviews. And that's really where the cutting edge research around methods and the, the primary guidance for undertaking system or scoping reviews is. So uh, to look at a, an actual application of a scoping review for meta research, uh, we're just going to talk about this article that um, I had participated in. And I will also just give a shout out to my the two primary um, authors of that, Dean Giustini and Kevin Reed, who did a lot of the, the work on this. And I was um, very happy to participate in it. 
So for this particular study, we wanted to essentially figure out how health sciences librarians were engaging around open science, specifically like what kinds of services were we offering, what kinds of support and what kinds of programs were being offered. Then we had some specific research questions about how, um, what drivers there are, what barriers there are, what kind of roles and so on. Uh, we of course started by creating a study protocol. And that's just one of those things that you need to do if you're going to be uh, actually doing one of these methods-based types of reviews. And so uh, we actually wrote it up as basically a manuscript and we put it up on the open science framework. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about study protocols um, later down in the road here. For our inclusion and exclusion criteria, um, we were specifically looking at things that we're really from 2010 to the present at the time that we conducted the study. And um, things that really had to be in health sciences libraries, not just academic libraries or public libraries or hospital libraries, but um, health sciences libraries that uh, were providing some sort of service or partnership uh, talking about open science. So we developed all of these inclusion and exclusion criteria a priori, of course. Um, then we planned out our data sources and how we would actually conduct our literature search. We looked in lots of different types of databases. Again, we searched from 2010 to the present. And then we did, because of our, the scope of our topic, we really needed to do a lot of additional searches as well. And um, that had to do with hand searching journals, you know, hand searching, actually just reviewing tables of contents, but also looking at association websites and conference abstracts. So we tried to be as thorough as possible to be able to capture the whole breadth of information. And we did that in part because Health sciences librarians are notorious for having our main outlet of dissemination be conference proceedings and not usually much beyond that. So that was a huge source for us. So for search strategy development, of course, we're librarians. We spent a lot of time on that part. Not going to go into it here. Happy to chat more if you like. Um, but basically, we looked for things that were on libraries and librarians, things that were on health sciences, and things that were um, having to do with open sciences. So then uh, we did our study selection and screening after we had conducted our searches and deduplicated all of them. And we started, of course, with dual title and abstract screening. Then we moved on to dual full text screening. And at both stages, we uh, did consensus discussions with our entire research group to um, ensure that we were finding the studies that we were hoping for. Then we moved on to data extraction, also done in duplicate. Um, and for our particular study, um, we developed our extraction forms thinking that we knew what we were going to be looking for. But really, um, a lot of how we developed it was iteratively through uh, all of the testing that we did in advance and the discussions that we had around consensus for the kinds of themes that we were seeing um, and the kinds of topics that we ended up wanting to include. We used Google Sheets, we added all sorts of data fields in there, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, some of that later. So um, when we actually had identified the 54 studies that we ended up including, or 54 items essentially that we ended up including, we looked at uh, doing a somatic analysis. And that was really to answer some of those original research questions that we had, like what were the, the drivers? What were the barriers? Um, what kinds of services were being offered? You know, where were people focusing their efforts? That sort of thing. And we did that in a pretty um, inductive kind of way where it was an iterative process of familiarization and then actually coming up with codes and then reviewing and uh, refining them as we went along. 
We also in a priori had identified a framework that we wanted to use to categorize the publications um, so that we made sure that we were using consistent kinds of terminology to actually describe the uh, results and weren't coming up with our own, but really could then fit them into a larger, um, broader scheme of, of understanding for people. And then we looked at some of those emergent themes as well. Um, so in results, I'm not going to go over it very much, but as I said, we had identified 54 studies. We categorized them according to the Foster Open Science Taxonomy. Um, we also analyzed the publications, um, so looking specifically at the date ranges where they were actually published, like what countries were working on this, what type of publication was it? Was it mostly journal articles or was it a conference proceeding, for example, or a newsletter article? Um, and what kinds of methods were people really using to look at these open science topics? And then of course, we were able to figure out some areas where research was lacking. So um, that, was, that was basically the example. And now I'm gonna just talk a little bit about why this is kind of an example of using a scoping review uh, for meta research. So really one of the things to think about if you are looking at doing a scoping review is to really understand whether or not a scoping review is the type of methodology that really makes sense for your specific topic. Um, if you have a question, if you want to um, answer a question, if you really want to get into like grading and evaluating evidence, a scoping review is really not what you're going to want to look for. A scoping review is really to be um, broad and all encompassing. You really want to use a scoping review to do things like identify research gaps figure out what the scope of research is, uh, understand how research is conducted in a specific field or on a specific topic. And of course, you want to use um, a robust methodology for actually finding the literature. I think the other um, kind of study that often gets used for similar areas in meta research is just a cross-sectional study of the literature. So people might uh, for example, um, just say that they're going to select a random sample from a specific year, or they'll select um, a random sample uh, from things on a certain topic. A scoping review is going to be broader and more all-encompassing within the limits, of course, that you set. So it tends to give you this broader um, picture of what the research can do, what it looks like, and um, how it, it can be conducted as well. Of course, I've already mentioned a couple of times, you wanna make sure that you're actually looking at the appropriate guidance for how to do a scoping review um, when you start. And uh, the one that I recommend is looking at the, the JBI Institute, the Joanna Briggs Institute. Um, and uh, you wanna make sure that you are planning for a large and multidisciplinary team. And this is because scoping reviews can be enormous but it's also because you really do want to make sure that you have some expertise built into your team on these specific areas of methodology, as well as on the, the topic that you're looking at. So I, of course, as a librarian, always advocate for having a librarian or information specialist involved in actually doing and conducting the search because they have the greatest expertise in what kinds of information sources are out there. But they really need to do that in conjunction with topic experts who can help point to things like the fact that health sciences librarians don't publish in uh, their research in journals that they really are going to be focusing on conference proceedings, for example. So you need the, the, that topical expertise as well to really help um, make sure that you have a robust uh, search that you are going to be using. And of course, depending on how many people that you have on your team, how broad the scope of your scoping review is, you might need a lot of people to actually go through and screen some of those articles. Um, and then I also, of course, suggest and really you know, demand <laughs> that you start with a protocol. Uh, this is just like a systematic review and other types of evidence synthesis where you need to have that planned out in advance um, with a few caveats that I'm going to talk about in a minute. 
having a protocol and registering it when you're talking about a, a scoping review is different than when you're talking about a systematic review, um, especially um, it doesn't matter what subject it is. Scoping reviews are actually somewhat notoriously difficult to register. Um, and it wasn't until recently that the OSF or Open Science Framework um, produced a template that people can use to um, adapt for a, a scoping review. So there is a systematic review template in the OSF registries that you can theoretically use for a scoping review, but uh, because it's for a slightly different methodology, um, some of the questions in there may not be entirely applicable, but it is something that I think that you really want to take a look at and consider because that's really the only place where you can get that total registration. So um, if you were doing a systematic review, on the other hand, there's this really nice registration database called Prospero that's been around for ages. You can't put scoping reviews in Prospero. They've sort of nixed it. Um, the other thing that you can do is what we did, which is to uh, just create a protocol and then publish it on a, a registry or a, on a generalist repository like OSF or others. Um, and of course, you can also publish scoping review protocols in journals. So there are several journals that will accept that from systematic reviews, for example, to um, BMJ Open, and there's, there's many others that will actually publish scoping review protocols. So I did see a question come through in the chat, um, and I am going to uh, get to that question in just a moment. So I did not ignore it. I'm, I just am uh, waiting. OK, so um, the next thing to kind of keep in mind is something I've already discussed a little bit, which is that search process. and. Because it's not like a cross-sectional study where you are, are just you know, getting a sample, you're looking at a specific year, you've just made the, the decision that you're going to you know, pick five journals and take all of them, um, you really do need to be thinking pretty much in the same depth that you would for a systematic review about what kind of of sources of information that you might really need. And we see with scoping reviews that very often that they tend to go beyond uh, the usual kinds of databases that you would normally consider. So, you know, for systematic review, you would tend to use uh, Medline, Embase, Cochrane uh, Central, um, but for, um, for scoping reviews, it, it tends to be a little bit more iterative of a process. So you do want to make sure that you have those determinations of what kinds of sources that you want to use in advance. Um, but with scoping reviews, because you're really trying to understand that full picture, you might come across things as you're actually doing your search that you need to add things. And But you might also want to do things like in advance, contact experts in that area about where you should consider looking. Um, you know, are there listservs that you can reach out to, to identify people, to get suggestions? Um, you may want to look and do some pre-searching to see what kinds of things might even be out there before you actually begin to write your protocol. And that can give you a good understanding of what it is that you want to, to actually look at. You do, of course, want to make sure that you are really looking and considering the geographic bias of your selected sources. And um, for our study, that was actually one of the things I think that was really important because all of us were based in North America, so Canada and the United States, uh, and yet all of the work in open science is really being done in Europe primarily. So uh, we, but we didn't know all of the sources that were out there that were available for health sciences uh, librarians in Europe. And so we actually ended up finding additional things as we went along and through doing some of these um, like pre-steps of contacting experts and pre-searching to try and identify resources. Um, and that was really helpful. 
is if you are doing an iterative process, you just want to make sure that you are recording that and, you know, as part of any kind of protocol variation, just like you would do with the systematic review. Um, one other example that I uh, mentioned here is another scoping review that I was involved in. This is the title and you can you know, Google it if you are interested. Um, but we actually ended up finding reference in one of the included papers that we had to a conference that we didn't know about. Um, and the majority then of our output um, ended up coming from this conference proceedings that we, we found through this iterative process. And if we had only stuck with our protocol, we wouldn't have been able to actually find essentially like half of the information that we did that we ended up including in our scoping review. Another thing to think about with these is, of course, that they're, they can be enormous depending on what your topic is. So, you know, the one that I'm talking about here with the open science was small. We only had 54 items that we ended up finding. So newspaper articles, conference proceedings, journal articles, total only 54. Um, <clears throat> some of them will be enormous and it really depends on what your topic is. Um, but generally because of the size and the scope <laughs> of a scoping review, you might want to plan for 18 to 24 months uh, to actually do that. So sometimes scoping reviews will have tens of thousands of articles involved. At any point, automation may help. Um, and one of the examples that I just want to mention that you may have, be familiar with is iRise. Um, the um, I rise souls, which is what systematic online living evidence synthesis. They uh, do. They have a scoping review on um, basically interventions to improve research reproducibility, and they have twenty thousand citations that they're looking at. So automation really makes a lot of sense in that kind of case. But when you are thinking about doing automation and really trying to scrape data. You do want to think about a few things. Um, it can get you into trouble with licenses and copyright and that sort of thing if you're using it to actually extract data from the articles versus um, doing some of the screening. So just one thing to consider. OK. Um, and then a few challenges uh, to think about. And I'm sorry, the, the part about the, the categorization is still down the road. So. Coming back to it still, I promise. One of the big challenges I think with scoping reviews and part of the reason why people do scoping reviews is that the topic that they're looking at may be kind of nebulous. Like maybe it's not even well understood in the literature or maybe it's just so big and so broad that you really need to take a close look at it and figure out what do you mean by these specific concepts? So one of the things that, um, that we found for our particular study is that we really needed clear definitions of the terms that we were looking at. And um, what we ended up looking at was um, creating a glossary to actually help ourselves through that whole process. If you want to take a look at the glossary, I put the link there. Um, but it is it was something that really helped us get consistency in how we were thinking about the topics. Because with the scoping reviews, it just might be so broad that you can't necessarily even be, uh, see the full scope in advance. So it's helpful to have that. Another challenge is really around the fact that so much junk is published. And this is true in every type of research, of course, but evidence synthesis in particular. But scoping reviews have become kind of a trend and a fad. And a lot of people are doing them who might not know what goes into a scoping review or what you want, want to use a scoping review for. They just see the word scoping review and then they you know, glom onto it. So one of the things that I really recommend is that if you are doing this, don't look at examples that are published. If you wanna do something that's really high quality, make sure that you're really starting with looking at the methods first, and then you can see other examples that might be published that, um, and you can see how they might actually meet some of those methods and how they might not. 
Um, another challenge, of course, is the complete reporting. Um, so like with other types of evidence synthesis, uh, scoping reviews do actually have a specific extension uh, for PRISMA, specifically for scoping reviews. It's PRISMA SCR, PRISMA for scoping reviews. But it was published a really long time ago. It was published way before PRISMA 2020, which is the most recent guidance. And so there's actually a, quite a lot of conflict in between those two um, pieces of reporting guidance. Uh, so I strongly suggest that you use PRISMA 2020 kind of as the basis and then make sure that you're looking at PRISMA SCR to add on additional things. Um, one of the main differences really is actually in how you report the search. So PRISMA 2020 and PRISMA S, which is the extension for um, reporting searches, which can also be used for scoping review searches. They both, for example, say that you need to record all of the searches that you are doing. Um, you need to not just have one example. Prisma SCR is built on the old <laughs> reporting model where you only had to have one search example. So that's just one kind of tricky challenge to keep in mind. It's not all of the reporting guidance is kind of kept up with um, how we are trying to report evidence synthesis overall. But the biggest challenge is, is really, I think, around the results. And this kind of gets to um, the question that was in the chat. And I think it really depends about how you actually go about categorizing and how you actually go about analyzing the articles. There is not a specific software that you can use, um, but it, it really... It depends on what your question is and what kinds of, of categorizations that you're going to use. And this really does get into this data extracting and charting component, um, in part because you may not know what the things that you want to actually extract are when you're doing a scoping review at the beginning. Like you might know some basic things like author, title, journal name, you know, geographic location. Um, you know, what type of study it is, for example. Um, but a lot of times you're, what you're gonna have to do is really figure out, um, and based on the scope of your results, what kinds of tools might be the best and how you can actually test those, how you can iterate them to make sure that you are getting the results that you're hoping for. And uh, really, um, reanalyze them as you're going along. And then you may have to go back and do you know, the literature that you already did if there's new, th new things out there. So we used Google Sheets for our categorization, but we only had 54 articles. So that was easy. Um, if you are doing something the scope of like iRise Souls, um, they're actually using R to do a lot of their uh, categorization. And they use a whole bunch of software behind the scenes to um, actually identify things like is it an open access publication and did they share data and that sort of thing. So there's software that people have custom built, including I think some actually from Quest, um, that, that people can use to pull out some of these factors. But there's not a specific software out there. One that you can think about is um, like Covenants, which is um, a screening tool, also has data extraction forms that you can use. RAN is another uh, screening tool that you can actually use for extraction. Um, but there, it, there's no single solution. It really depends on what your topic is and what uh, you have accessible to you as a team. Another challenge with the results, I think, is that there's often a temptation to do way too much. So scoping reviews are really meant to be descriptive. You don't want to get into doing a critical analysis of um, the study designs and the items that you're taking, for example. Um, you can record how many of them are using what type of research designs and what types of things are missing or, or present, but you don't really want to spend, um, you don't want to evaluate it. If you do want to evaluate the research, then you should be using a different type of method. Okay, and sorry, my mouse is not working here. Um, part of that is because usually in a scoping review, you're really only going to have very simple qualitative and quantitative data. And that might be expressed in things that are simple as the frequencies, the counts of, of things that, that meet certain um, categorizations and criteria. Um, and 
so for meta research topics that scoping reviews are often used, there's a lot of times and opportunities where you can use established things like checklists, like Prisma 2020 or Tidier or any number of the, the kind of reporting guidance or um, methodological quality types of tools that are out there. But a lot of it is really using uh, categorizations and the categorizations categorizations, excuse me, are going to really depend upon what it is that your topic is. So there's not a specific kind of categorization that's out there. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we did in a second. Um, and you can consider grouping by themes, but you don't really need to get into an analysis of, of your themes. So one thing if you do want to do sort of more of a thematic analysis is to consider, you know, pre-finding um, a framework or some other sort of established set of themes that you actually can adopt and use for categorizations. You can use inductive coding to identify what those themes are, if that makes sense uh, as well. Um, but generally, uh, once you start getting into more of inductive coding types of measures, then you might be moving into other types of reviews like meta narrative, for example. So for us, um, what we did uh, is really test a form that we um, used and we tested it all together using three sample articles. And there was a bunch of things that we identified as we went through that testing process that really needed to be fixed. And we had pre-specified to begin with that we were going to be doing categorization using the Foster taxonomy, which really is um, just like a, a big schema of all of the terms related to open science. We also adopted other kinds of categorizations. So for example, we looked at medical subject headings to be able to identify specific publication types. So again, we had that standard terminology for categorizations. And that was what made sense uh, for us to use for our particular topic. Then we did do some thematic analysis where we really looked at the data, we did some initial coding, and then we were defining some of our themes, but a lot of them were really just directly related to what our original research questions were, like, what are the barriers? Where are people involved in policy? Uh, things like that. So we kind of knew what we were looking for already. Another issue, and I know that Tracy is an expert in results display <laughs> and graphic uh, visualization of results, but for scoping reviews, um, it tends to not be very fancy. A lot of what we, we tend to use and tend to see are just tables lots of tables. Um, and in fact, you might even see the full data extraction sheets, um, sometimes built into the journal articles like it is for the one I'm talking about today. Um, or you might see them uh, as actually a supplemental data, depending on the size and scope of what you're looking at. But for graphics, it tends to be pretty hard because um, you're really just talking about frequencies and proportions and things. So you have to be a little creative. But one of the, the main things that people use are called evidence gap maps, which are graphical displays where you can see areas where there are gaps, um, like where there's not enough research done or less research done, areas where there's a lot of research that's being done. And I'll show you a couple of examples of that in a second. Um, but you often are going to have to be quite creative in figuring out ways to visualize your data. Um, in my article uh, that I'm talking about is not a very good representation of creative uh, data display. So I can't recommend it, which is why I'm going to show lots of other examples instead that you can uh, benefit from, hopefully. So these are just a couple of examples. Um, the one in the top left up there is a type of evidence gap map. Um, you can see that it has different shading. Uh, it indicates like the more bold the color is, the, the, the depth of saturation of color means there's more evidence in that specific topic. It's just laid out in a grid format here. If it's pale, there's very little. Um, and then they have actually these kind of two color schema to group them by um, different topic that they have determined. The one um, below it is just a nice infographic kind of uh, display to, again, give you that frequency information. 
And the one on the right, uh, of course, is more of a geographical distribution kind of, of demonstration. And it's using you know, bubbles that will show the size uh, and the, the scope, essentially, of um, how much research there is in that specific area. A couple more examples for you. Um, this uh, top one is another evidence gap map. And um, this one, it, instead of having numbers, it has these different size bubbles. And you can actually hover over those and then it will, and click on them, in fact, and then it will show you all of the evidence that is in that specific categorization. So, for example, um, the one of the biggest bubble that's on there is in the environmental outcomes of forest coverage, and it has to do with area protection and management. So you know that that's kind of one of the big areas, but there is nothing um, in uh, that they found, at least, that talks about private sector codes and legislation, as well as the acquisition uh, of knowledge and skills. So there's a it is a nice visual way to demonstrate where the evidence might be and where it's missing. The one on the bottom right is from iRise Souls. And this one is actually built on an R Shiny app that they have. And um, it's very customizable and um, very nice. This is just showing two categories, but you can play with this. And I've given you the link if you want to go and look at it sometime. Um, you can play with this and see all of the different, um, again, kind of bubble charts showing not only the topic, but like the depths and the, the breadth of uh, research in an area. Click on it, and then you get to see it all. It's pretty fabulous. So just a kind of brief recap, um, don't try and use a scoping review if another method might be better. Um, make sure that you really are planning for a lot of time to actually undertake this. It, they can be really labor intensive, but make sure that you are planning it out first. So start with that protocol and either register it or make sure that you are publishing it somewhere. And make sure that you are consulting that guidance so that the JBI manual in particular, make sure that you have that the team that you need, including, of course, a search expert, because as a librarian, I, I have to say that. Plus, I think, you know, it actually is true. Um, and don't really try to do too much with a scoping review. This, this is a like a categorization count frequency kind of um, result. This is not uh, to answer a question again. And make sure that you're using um, both Prisma 2020 and Prisma SCR uh, for actual reporting to make sure that you are doing the most uh, comprehensive and best reporting that you can. So I have some references on here that I think are really good that I would recommend that you take a look at, including Prisma SCR, the JBI manual, um, and some other ones as well. So um, with that, I will end and take additional questions. And thank you.